the soul that sinneth it shall die, and all of us have sinned. How can God rightfully forgive us? And here's the way he does. The only way he does, and the only hope of salvation. God, in the person of Jesus Christ, came into this world for the primary purpose of dying for our sins. Next on In Touch, Dr. Charles Stanley begins his new series, The Path of Spiritual Maturity. Today's message, The First Step, Salvation. Do you remember the first time your first child took their first step? Oh, you called your friends and your family, and you just said it's wonderful. It's just so awesome that they've taken their first step, and it was all just beautiful. And next thing you knew, something wrong. They were into everything. They went into this, into that, and everything. So your whole attitude changed. But uh, that's all right. That was the beginning of a whole new life for them. And there's the beginning of a whole new life for those who take another first step. Because there are many people who believe this. They believe that if I believe there's a God, that somehow in some way everything's going to be all right, and when I die, I'm going to heaven or I'm going somewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just because a person believes there is a God has nothing to do. I could believe there are many things that have no effect upon me at all. Just because I believe there is a God has nothing to do with having a personal relationship with that God. And if all you know is that, and believe that there is one and you don't have a personal relationship with him, then you're in trouble. And the title of this message is The First Step. And if you'll turn to the 16th chapter of Acts, and just give you a little background of what's happening here. Uh, Paul and Silas are on their um, second missionary journey. And uh, so they got thrown in jail. Thrown in jail, their feet were in the stocks, and uh, they had been beaten with rods. Now, we think beaten with a whip would be something, but beaten with rods, and it was against the law to beat any Roman citizen with rods and put them in jail without some real true, uh, real reason to do so. So, as a result, the Scripture says, verse 25 of the 16th chapter, But about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, what do you think they were singing? I don't have any idea what they were singing in Hebrew or Greek, but uh, if they'd had these songs, they'd have been singing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and a whole lot of songs like you and I know. Suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Just think about that. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped, because that was the wrong law. In other words, they gave you an authority and a position, and you didn't fulfill it, you'd had it. And so Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, uh, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, so whatever they were singing, whatever they were praying, he'd been listening. The other prisoners had been listening. And so they'd sung long enough and prayed enough. And they felt, wait a minute, these fellows are in stocks. I beat them with rods. Uh, they, they're in prison. And what are they singing about? So listen, they had, he had a very listening ear. And so he said to them, as he fell down before them, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not a lot of stuff about is there a God and this, that, the other. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in the house. He took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds. Immediately he was baptized, he and his whole household. And he brought them uh, out into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Now, when the chief magistrates came, for example, the rest of that passage says that they were scared to death because they found that they were Romans. It was against the law to beat and to chain a Roman like that. And so the interesting thing is that they went away freed, and the magistrates wanted them to go as quickly as possible, and please don't tell anybody what happened to you. But the most important statement in that whole series is this. He said, what must I do to be saved? 
And Paul said very clearly, look at this, just a simple verse. He said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe, watch this, not in Jesus, but believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved in your household. And so when I look at that passage and see how as simple it seemed to be, and think about how people think about God and salvation, whatever it might be, let me ask you a question. If somebody said to you, now tell me exactly what you mean by salvation. How, what would you say? What, what do you mean by salvation? Well, probably you'd have a pretty good answer, but I want to give you a very simple answer because this is a simple statement, it's all true, and all you have to do is to say, salvation is the work of God's grace. By, listen, by which He does what? He pardons our sins and bestows upon us what? The gift of eternal life. That's what salvation's all about. It's the work of God's grace. God's grace is what? His unmerited, undeserved favor and love for us. As a result of that, by which He pardons us, forgives us of our sins, and bestows upon us, we don't work for it, bestows upon us the gift of eternal life. So if somebody asks you what is salvation, that's a simple definition, but it clarifies everything. The grace of God is His unmerited, undeserved favor. He doesn't save us because we deserve anything. And so many people feel like if they know there's a God or believe there's a God, then they're saved, but absolutely they're not. So I want to talk about a couple of things primarily, and the first one is this, is our spiritual condition before salvation. If you ask the average person how they were doing, they'd probably say, well, I'm not too bad. And what they would do and what they will do is they will talk about other people or other things or circumstances and situations and say, you know what, I'm as good as that. I know some church members that do this and do that, and I'm as good as they are, so I'm not worried about going to heaven because I don't do any bad things. Nothing can be further from the truth because... All of that is based on what you believe that God thinks about your conduct, your work, your attitudes, your this and your that. And when He says by grace, that means unmerited, undeserved love for us. God does not save us on the basis of how much you do, who you are, what you have. He saves us on the basis of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ the Lord. No matter what else you believe, you cannot deny that truth. And you cannot expect to be saved on the basis of anything that you do. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. So if somebody says, well, uh, what kind of life are you living? And uh, let's say, for example, that you're not a Christian. So I want to give you a few scriptures here, beginning in Ephesians chapter 2. Look at that for a moment. And Paul is dis saying to the Ephesians, this is what we were before we were saved, because it's true of all of us. So if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, made that commitment of your life. And if you're honest, you will agree with these Scriptures. Listen to this. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There are three deaths. There's physical death that most all of us will probably experience at some point. There is spiritual death. That is, we're dead to the things of God. And there's eternal death when a person is eternally separated from God and spends eternity in hell. So look at this. Here's what he's saying. He says in this passage, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. Not now, because they've been saved. You formerly walked. Now watch this also. When he uses the word walks here, he means this was a lifestyle. This was an ongoing thing with you. This is the way you lived. You lived in trespasses and sins, doing your own thing. According to the course of this world, look at the course of the world you and I live in. According to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them, watch this, among them we too all formerly lived. That is, all of us who are believers. This is the way we used to live. In the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. He says, before you were saved, he says, this is where you lived. And somebody says, well, I don't think I was that bad. Yes, you were. In fact, you were worse than this. Listen to what he says. 
formerly you lived in the lust of your flesh, that is, you followed the normal human desires apart from God that every person has. Every person has that old sin nature within them, and we all allowed Satan to work in our lives so that we just, we just wanted to do what we wanted to do. And he says, but God being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved. He says, look, salvation is, in other words, God took you when you were living in sin. And many of you, for example, who were saved later on in life, you look back in your life and you think, oh God, I don't know why you saved me, because He loves you. And all of us have lived in the transgressions of the laws of God. We've lived according to those lustful thoughts within us. And lust doesn't mean uh, necessarily just sex, but lust for money, lust for uh, recognition, lust for this, that, and the other, and so forth. And so that's the way the world lives. You look around you, we live in that kind of world. Then in Isaiah 59, here's what he says. He says, our sins, watch this carefully, our sins separate us from God. Now watch this. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have any personal relationship with Him. You may have a mental relationship. Well, I know He's out there and so forth. But you don't have a personal relationship with Him. The Bible says sin separates us from God. And, for example, if you don't even claim to be a Christian, you know in your heart of what sin does. It makes you feel guilty. You have all kinds of feelings. But it has separated you from God. We all come into this world sinning against Him, and that's why salvation is what? Is the pardon of our sins and the bestowal upon us of eternal life. And so then, of course, in Romans 6, 23, you probably know that, he says the wages of sin is death. It is physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. But when Christ comes into our life, what happens? It's no longer spiritual death and no longer eternal death. Physical death, yes. Then, of course, in Hebrews 9, 27, here's what he says. He says, it is appointed unto man and women, one, listen, once to die and after this the judgment. And for example, in the seventh chapter of Matthew, uh, he says, uh, many will say in that day, did I not prophesy and cast out devils and all these things? It's interesting Jesus didn't just say anybody, but he took the people who would be most uh, recognized as surely you're going to heaven. And he said of them because they uh, rejected him. He said, but when you stand before the Lord God, he will say, I never knew you. It has nothing to do with your position, your ability to speak and do all of these things. It has to do only with the grace of God. So when a person says, well, where am I if I have never trusted Jesus as my Savior? I feel pretty safe. Well, you're not safe. I can tell you where you are. You are dead spiritually in your trespasses, violating the laws of God, dead in your trespasses and sin, and you have absolutely no hope of eternal life until you have a personal relationship with Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That is the simple, clear teaching of the Word of God. And no matter what somebody tells you, they have to deny the Bible in order to believe what they believe. Not by works of righteousness, he says, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saves us. So turn to Titus. And uh, I want you to listen to this passage beginning in, um, in verse 3. His, he says, here's where we were. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hating and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, watch this, He saved us not on the basis of our deeds, period. Which means there is nothing within us that brought about salvation. He says nothing we've done in our righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration, or the cleansing of it, and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us, listen, which through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that now being justified by His grace, declared righteous by His grace, unmerited favor and love, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So that the Bible is very clear. 
that there is absolutely no salvation apart from a relationship to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. We'll explain that in a moment. But the truth is where we are. Transgressions, disobeying God, He's described in these passages how people are living. Look around you today. How are people living? They have all kind of prejudices. They have all kind of ways of disobeying God that you and I grew up. We didn't even know about those ways. The world is living in sin. And you look around you just in our society. What has happened to us in the last 20 years, for example? What, watch this. What, what the Word of God says is sin. What you and I grew up believing this is sin. Today they say, no, that's not sin any longer. It's going to be okay for everybody. So this, listen, if there is no Bible, there is no compass. If there is no compass, you're wayward. You're going here, you're going there. No one would attempt to cross the ocean without a compass. And we're living in a world where people's morals are changing, their, their attitudes are changing. And one of the reasons is because they have decided that the Word of God just doesn't work anymore. And therefore, this is what I believe. What you have to ask is this, what will be the moral compass in your life? If it is not the Bible, what is it? And what, listen to this, would you be willing to live and die by that compass that you have, which says that you have excluded the Bible from your life, and you have decided you're going to live according to your compass, according to your ways, according to what you think? And I can tell you what that is. They've just been described. Disobedience, lust of the flesh, and you name it. If the Bible isn't your compass, you have no true, genuine compass to live by. And so no matter what you hear people say about, well, here's what I believe about God and this religion, that religion, doesn't make any difference. If this isn't your compass, then you have a major problem. Because one of these days, you're going to stand before God. One of these days, you're going to die. And because there is physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. Physical death, we probably will experience that. Notice I said probably Jesus could come. Spiritual death, dead in, listen, dead in trespasses and violating the law of God. So he says, this is where we are. So what is God's provision for that? And here's God's provision. And that is God's provision, let me say first of all, is motivated by love. And, um, and let's go, if you will, to uh, Romans 5 for a moment and, and, just, and just hold this Romans 5 for a moment. And then while you're turning to that, uh, what verse comes to your mind and heart about, um, about your salvation and, and God's love? What verse? So quote it to me. For God... Do you believe that? Yes. He said, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in Him. That doesn't mean some, just any kind of passing belief, and I'm going to explain that in a second. And so I want you to look at Romans 5 for a moment. He makes this very clear. Because if you ask the average person, above average, whatever average is, most anybody you ask, they're going to tell you that they believe that they're going to be okay when they die because they haven't been too bad, haven't been in prison. Uh, more prisoners have more truth than some people out of prison because they've already, they've already been saved in prison and so forth. But yet we're talking about people who just believe that, you know, I'm going to be okay. Listen to this. Romans 5, Romans 5 verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out, it, it not sifted out, poured out. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who's given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were helpless to save ourselves. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now, 
been justified, it means to be declared righteous by His blood as, as a result of the cross. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, brought back into relationship with Him, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult or rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation, brought back into relationship with Him. So when I look at these verses and, and see what He says, then how are we saved? How does, a person, how does a person become saved? Well, let's think about it for a moment. We, we, we've just said it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. It's not by our conduct and what we're going to do and not do. And um, if you'll think about this, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was the first time and the only time God ever punished someone who had never sinned. Jesus never sinned. And so what happened? God said, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Now watch this carefully because people will live their whole lives and never understand this, though I've explained that a lot of times. God said, the soul that sinneth it shall die. That's the law of God. That's the rule of God. Now how can God forgive us of our sins and transgressions and violations of the law of God? How can He forgive us when He said, the soul that sinneth it shall die? Not just physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. How could He do that? Because if He just forgave us, then He would have violated His own law. The soul that sinneth it shall die, and all of us have sinned. How can God rightfully forgive us? And here's the way He does. The only way He does, and the only hope of salvation. God in the person of Jesus Christ, came into this world for the primary purpose of dying for our sins. And in so doing, He came into the world also to show us who God is and what He's like. God sent Him into the world, His only begotten Son, for the primary purpose of doing what? Of dying on the cross, shedding His blood. His blood is atoning blood. That is, it's blood that pays our sin debt in full. But now watch this. When He came into the world to die on the cross, God placed upon Jesus all the sins of all mankind all the way back to Adam and Eve. And Jesus had to be God. Because if it had been anybody else, they could only have died for their own sins. But Jesus was sinless. He was the perfect Son of God, the perfect Lamb. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, came into the world, and the Father crucified Him. You say, well, the Romans did it. No, they didn't. The Romans were the tools to drive, drive the nails, but the Father crucified Him because He came for that reason. And what did He do? He placed your guilt, my guilt, the guilt of all mankind upon Jesus Christ, crucified Him, the shedding of His blood, which was the ultimate and final sacrifice. It was the sacrifice of His Son. Now watch this. Which means that the death of Jesus Christ, how would you describe it? Sacrificial. It's sacrificial because the Father took the life of His own Son, having placed upon Him the sin debt of the whole world. So, the fact that He paid your, your sin debt in mine, then what happens? God says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. But He provided a sacrifice for you and me, so that in the death of Jesus, what happens? He paid the sin debt Himself for all of us. No Jesus, no sacrificial death, no salvation. Because the only way you could be saved, well, I'm going to be good enough to do this, that, and the other, and you know that doesn't work. So it was a sacrificial death. Secondly, it was a substitutionary death for this reason. What happened? Jesus was our substitute. You and I don't have to die for our sins. Because if we died for our sins, we'd die and be lost and eternally separated from God because God is holy God. We've forgotten about the fact that God is holy God. 
And holy means he cannot deal and will not deal with unholy things except in a righteous way. So his death was sacrificial. Secondly, his death was substitutionary. That is, he took your place in mine. And when I think about the way t people talk about Jesus, and today they don't, they don't want to cross up on a hill, and they don't want to talk about Jesus and outlawing the Bible in schools and all these things, I want to tell you something. Listen carefully. I said it. This is moral, spiritual suicide. Because there is un only one way for man to be acceptable in the eyes of God. And that is, if I reject Jesus as the sacrifice for my sins, then I will pay for my sins. When I die, I will be eternally separated from God. So there's a sacrificial, it's a sacrificial death, it's a substitutionary death, and it is a sufficient death. Only the sinless Son of God could pay for my sins. If He'd have been anybody else but God Himself in human flesh, that wouldn't work. He would have been dying for His own sins. So the death of Jesus Christ is the heart of the Word of God. It is a sacrificial, substitutionary, all-sufficient death of Jesus Christ that makes the difference between whether you and I go to heaven or whether we don't. It's the only acceptable sacrifice. So if, if whatever else I do that I call a sacrifice to God, think about this. It's unacceptable to Him. And here's the reason why. Because our heart is sinful. Is there anybody in here or out there listening or looking who would deny the fact that you are a sinner? That you not only have sin, but that you do sin? And if you reject Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would ask you this simple question, and I already know the answer. What are you depending upon to get God to accept you? When holy God hates sin, doesn't hate the sinner, He hates sin. Because that sin has done what? Has separated mankind from Him. If you accept Jesus as that substitutionary death, and you accept Him as being the sacrificial one, an all-sufficient one, and you believe that He's the Son of God, and you trust Him for your salvation, you ask, believing that He is the Lord Jesus Christ, atonement for your sin, you'll be saved. If you, do, if you do not believe that, you have to come up with another way. Can you tell me another way to be saved? No, you can't. Because you see, it's the condition of the heart. There's not anybody here or there who would deny the fact that you have lived in sin. What did you do about that sin? Well, I went to this church and I got baptized, sprinkled, anointed, none, none of that. Who is the only person who gave his life, first of all, who is sinless, who gave his life sacrificially as a substitute, being accounted all sufficient in the eyes of God for your sins. Nobody and nothing but Jesus. This is why we say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You say, well, isn't that sort of prideful? No, it is truthful. It all goes back to the cross. For example, if you take all the teachings of the cross out of, uh, out of the New Testament, there wouldn't be much left. What do you have? What man can do? And so just look around you. You ask people where you work, where you live, your friends, your family, are you going to heaven? Well, some of them will say, I don't know. Well, that, that's a good answer because then you can say, well, I, I, I know I'm going. Well, that sounds very prideful. No, would you like to know why I think I'm going? I believe I'm going. I know I'm going. If they back off you, that means they're so guilty already they can't stand to hear it. They don't even want to hear it. So let's talk about you. Have you ever been saved? So I'm going I'm to talk about how here in a moment. But what I wanted you to see, I wanted you to see primarily here why God forgives us of our sins. It's a four-letter word, L-O-V-E. He loves us. And listen, if He made it our works, some people, in other words, what works? Would, would one thing be good for this person, not for that person? We can't even all do the same thing. You have nothing but confusion if you don't have the blood of Jesus. 
And so, when we see what he says about our sinfulness and about the fact of his death, he says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We certainly would agree with that. And that the wages of sin is death. And so, when he does come into our life, what happens? It transforms us. We're not, we're not the same person we used to be. For example, Paul put it this way. He says, therefore, if any person is in Christ, have that relationship. And I'm, I'm going to talk about how in just a second. If, if any person has that relationship, he says, old things pass away, behold, things become new. What happens? There is a difference. When a person's life is transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a different kind of life. You're going to walk different. You're going to sound different. You're going to look different in ways. I don't mean how you dress necessarily, but some people need to change their dress, no doubt about that. <laughs> but, for example, in Ephesians, it, this first chapter, go back there for a moment, uh, verse 13. He says, in him that is in Christ, that is, you have a relationship with him now, also, after, listen, after listening to the message of truth, and what is that message? The gospel of your salvation. Having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who, that is the Holy Spirit, who is given as a pledge, this is a pledge from God, of our inheritance, what we will receive, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now, think about this for a moment. Living in sin, disobedience to God, lost, separated from God. The adequate and only adequate substitute acceptable to God. The death of His Son. He's the only one who was sinless. So here's what happened. When He died, He opened the door to the world to be saved because He paid our sin debt in full because He was the perfect Son of God. And so salvation, as we said, is a gift from God. And now, how does that work in a person's life? So we said, well, you have to believe in Him. So I want to put a couple of other definitions up here for a moment. Saving faith, watch this. Saving faith is trust in Jesus as a living person, the Son of God for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life with God is trusting in Jesus. So when a person says, I want Jesus Christ as my Savior, then what I must do is I must be willing to ask Him to forgive me of my sins and place my trust in Him as the Lord and the Son of God who went to the cross and paid my sin debt in full by being crucified. I'm willing to believe that He, because of what He's done for me and God's acceptance of that, I'm willing to believe that He saves me. And the moment I do, the Holy Spirit, as He says, comes in and seals us as the child of God. So you say, well, what, what am I supposed to do? Saving faith is I place my trust in Jesus. Not, not Jesus is some idea, but the person of Jesus Christ who went to the cross died on the cross for our sins. I place my trust in Him. Now, somebody says, well, what about this Lordship business? And there are people who say, I want your salvation, Father, but I don't want you telling me how to live. I, I thank you for your forgiveness, and thank you for the gift of heaven, but don't tell me how to live. Lordship means rule in our life, guidance in our life, direction in our life. He's the one who makes decisions for us and shows us the will of the Father. I don't want that. I just want, I want forgiveness and I want salvation and uh, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want you as my Lord. So let me explain it repentance. Repentance is a heartfelt sorrow for sin. I'm ashamed. God, I'm, 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 I'm sorry for what I've done. A renouncing of it. I don't want that more, anymore in my life. A sincere commitment to forsake it and walk in obedience to Christ. Now listen very carefully. That is the confession of genuine repentance. Let me tell you what that means, what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that if I repent of my sins, that if I sin again, I'm going to be lost. That's not what it means. Think about this. I am asking God to forgive me. I'm ashamed of my sins. I'm renouncing it. I don't want any more in my life. And I want to walk in obedience. 
Are you listening? Say amen. amen. A little bit louder. Amen. Because many of you, for example, were saved in, you say, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, 60s, whatever it might be. And so maybe you had habits in your life. Maybe you drank. Maybe you had used profanity. Maybe you were very lustful. Maybe you didn't go to church. A lot of things in your life that weren't right, that's why you got saved. If you repent of your sin, what are you saying? You're saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what's in my life. I don't want this in my life. It doesn't fit who I am as, and will be as a child of God. I'm renouncing that. Does that mean that you won't commit any more sin? No. Because we, listen, because the lifestyle that we have had, whatever it might be, and as a young kid, for example, I didn't have any, much of any of that in my life, but God, if we repent of our sin, He accepts that. And so what? I may have to repent of it more than once. Salvation is I'm accepting Him as the Lord of my life. And that means He's in charge. But in my weakness, in my frailty, Lord, I didn't, I, I, God forgive me, I didn't want that. I, I, Lord, I said I would never do that again. We've all been there. It doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It means that your weakness and your frailty and that old sinful nature inside of us at times, uh, it surfaces. So what do we do? We ask God to forgive us. Watch this carefully. We ask God to forgive us and cleanse us on the basis of what He did at the cross. Not that I'm going to do better and be better. But somebody says, well, I can just sin after I'm saved and uh, everything's going to be fine. No, you cannot. That's why he says that the Lord disciplines us. He disciplines us and disciplines us and disciplines us until He disciplines that sin right out of our life. And so repentance, in other words, if I accept Him as my Savior, I acknowledge Him also as my Lord. And if you'll think about it, in any organization there's got to be a Lord. Somebody who runs, somebody who oversees it all and guides it. In your life and mine, we say, I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. Praise God. I'm forgiven of my sin. The Holy Spirit is within me. I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. And no more of that stuff. And then you shame yourself, disobey God, and you say, well, do I have to get saved all over again? I feel sorry for people who think, listen to this, that receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life for the forgiveness of your sins only means until you sin again. That's not what that means. But people who believe that you lose your salvation. So what, in other words, where were you before you were saved? Living in sin. Now that you're saved, you're forgiven, cleansed. And so what happens? The cleansing part, watch this carefully, is what the Bible calls sanctification. That is, God is continually cleansing us. And as I am willing for God to point out anything in my life necessary in order to keep me clean and pure and holy in Him, that's the way it ought to be. Anywhere I decided, you know what, I'm not giving that up. People say sometimes, well, I don't understand what God's doing in my life. I tell you, you brought it on yourself. But look, you didn't lose your salvation. You didn't lose your salvation. You just disobeyed God. And you know what? You ought to get on your knees and thank God for the discipline because He's just keeping His Word. If you confess your sins and if you repent of your sins, you don't repent of it, expect the hand of God to come upon you. Now here's a question I'd ask you. Do you know in your heart, at one particular point in your life, you asked God to forgive you of your sins? You understood something of the death of Christ. Notice I didn't say everything. Something of the death of Christ, that His death paid your sin debt in full, and that now you've become a child of God. Do you know that? So let me, let me give you a little space here. I was only 12 years of age. I didn't even know what substitution, sacrifice, I didn't know what any of that meant. The only thing I knew at that point in my life, and I remember very clearly, I knew that I was a sinner and that I was lost and I had a conviction that I was lost at 12 years of age and that I needed to be saved. And I was asking Jesus Christ to save me because He was the Savior and He was the Lord. That's probably just about the sum total of my knowledge. But the reason I'm telling you this is I want you to understand what happened. I wish somebody had set me down and said, look, Charles, let me tell you, what, let me tell you what's going on. 
then I probably would have been a better preacher years ago. But I don't have to understand all things, all those things, but I have a responsibility to learn. So you're saved by His grace. There's not a thing in the world you have ever done to merit it. That grace is unmerited, undeserved love poured out in your life. So where does repentance fit in all this? Does it mean that you, that you get saved by repentance? No. You're saved by the grace of God. But repentance is a part of the recognition of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Master of my life. Somebody says, well, can I just go ahead and sin all I want to and, uh, and be saved? I've met people like that, a lot of folks like that. And you know what? I've never met one that I knew close enough that did not deeply regret walking away from God. Can a person walk away from God in sin, living in sin? Yes, they can. Uh, does that mean that they're lost? No, it doesn't. But here's what it does mean. God's awesome hand of judgment will come upon them. You see, that's what grace is all about, His love. He, it, it, he's gracious in His love, but He is also demanding righteousness and holiness in all of our lives. And so I would say to you today, can you look back at some point in your life where you can say, I know that at that point in my life, I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. You say, well, I didn't understand it all then. Well, neither did I. But, I. but here's what happened. I did what I did, I fully understood, and that is I was a sinner and that God had saved me. And maybe today for the first time in your life you've understood why Jesus had to die. You see, the only way Jesus can justify you as a child of God is having died as a sacrifice for your sins. And so we are saved by His grace, goodness, love, and mercy. And I would encourage you, if you've never trusted Him as your Savior, say, God, I'm ashamed of the life that I've lived. I've, I've claimed to be something I'm not. I'm asking you to forgive me and to cleanse me. I do acknowledge you as the Lord and Savior of my life. God, I just want you to clean me up and make me one of your children. Let me just say this to you. You don't have to beg Him. When you come to Him, with a, when you come to him sincerely, he will answer the petition of your heart. And that's my prayer for you. Father, how grateful we are that you didn't give us a list of do's and don'ts. You just gave us one statement. Faith in the sacrificial, all-sufficient, atoning death of your Son on the cross. And the surrender of our life to him as the Lord and Master. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I pray that every person who hears this, who has never been saved, who's dependent on something within themselves to realize there is no hope apart from the sacrificial, all-sufficient death of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary one who took our place in Jesus' name. Amen. When you take the first step and trust Jesus to forgive your sins, the peace that comes from having a saving faith is yours forever. At InTouch.org, learn more about placing your trust in Jesus and growing in faith. There you can find today's message, The First Step, Salvation. You'll also find a library of free and inspiring messages from Dr. Stanley, sermon notes, and resources to help strengthen your walk with Christ. Download the InTouch app to take the teaching of Dr. Stanley on the go or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. The Spirit-filled life is a life lived through us by the Holy Spirit, and the goal is to demonstrate and to express the character of Jesus Christ. An intimate look into the ministry of Dr. Stanley, The Spirit-filled Life, a new edition of one of his classic books, this biblical perspective on the work of the Holy Spirit can deepen your intimacy with God.
Come on, guys. Let's go. We're going to be late. Mom, is my homework in my bag? I think so, honey. Bye. Mom, I forgot to take the dog out. That's okay. Love you. Love you. Bye. Have a good one. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John recorded Christ's great unveiling, Revelation, God's climactic story of hope fulfilled, warning, the day of wrath and judgment. Blessed are those who will live forever in the new heaven and earth. Life Principles to Live By Dr. Charles Stanley's exploration of the 30 foundational truths that continue to guide his life and ministry. Order a box set on CD or DVD at intouch.org. Share a personal message on a beautiful note card from the lens of Dr. Charles Stanley. Enjoy six nautical designs featuring boats from around the world in this 18-card set. Because of Adam and Eve, we have a sin nature from the start. The Bible tells us that the payment for our sin is death. So on our own, there is no escape. Our eternal destiny is loss. But on the cross, the sinless Christ willingly paid this debt. His death reversed the curse for all who believe. He became our rescuer from hell, giving us the hope of heaven and a new life filled with joy and peace. This is what is meant by the gift of salvation. Often people will tell you that they came to Christ in order to escape eternal punishment and to go to heaven. But is this the wrong motivation for seeking the Lord? Let's take a look at an email from someone who is concerned about this, and they write, I'm scared that I only want to be saved in order to escape hell. Honestly, I want a safety net more than I want a relationship with God. What can I do? Well, let me ask you this. Do you really and truly understand how to be saved? That you place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and receive Him not only as your Savior, but the Lord and the Master of your life. It appears your focus is hell and not the Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see Him as an escape route and nothing more? Do you understand why He saved us? Not in order that you and I would escape something, but that He would bring us into a personal relationship with Him, an intimate relationship with Him. Salvation enables us to avoid hell, no doubt. God's goal for us is Romans 8.29. Listen to what He says. He says He predestined that you and I would be conformed to the likeness of His Son, which means in character, conduct, conversation, our whole life would be shaped into the likeness of Christ, which is what happens when you and I are truly following Him and when He is the Lord and Master of our life. But according to what you're thinking, there's no mention of obedience, of serving God, or worshiping God. Who is this Jesus to you? Ask yourself these questions. What's the meaning of the cross, the death of Jesus, serving Jesus? You need to deal with your sin against Christ, not heaven and hell, but your relationship to Him. And it appears you have no desire for Christ and His will in your life, you want an escape route. My friend, there is no escape route. The question is, are you really saved? Have you ever truly asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin because your sin is against Him and you have separated yourself from Him? If the only thing you want to do is to escape hell, you won't escape it until, first of all, Jesus Christ becomes your Savior and you recognize that His death at the cross was payment for your sin personally and that He saved you in order not to keep you from hell, though that's a byproduct. He saved you in order to have a personal relationship with you and to conform you to the likeness of His Son. Don't ever forget that. That's the most important part. Well, thank you for watching In Touch. And if you want to experience the Christian life in all of its power, allow Jesus Christ to live His life in and through you. 
He'll make all the difference in the world. Leading people worldwide into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and strengthening the local church. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is a presentation of In Touch Ministries. This program is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.